Okay, welcome to CE 526. So what I want to do right now is the background that you've gained from learning about systemic safety evaluation. I want to use a presentation that was given to us um, by Sean Carney, one of our um, you know graduates, one of our grad, one of our graduates uh, from a while back, and he uh, gave this presentation to the safety class. Uh, I believe it was last year, and he talked about how his company, DKS Associates, helps the uh, you know helps in cities implement the systemic safety analysis, and how that safe, systemic safety analysis then gets uh, uh, you know that gets used in the in the grant funding process, so or applying for grant funding. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And again, this presentation was given originally by uh, Mr. Sean Carney, who is a Cal Poly graduate, employee of the DKS Associate. So I'm very thankful for him to, to make this presentation available to us. So I'm gonna go ahead and start presenting. So the context of this presentation is, how do we use the systemic safety analysis process that you learn from an NCHRP report with regards to pedestrian uh, crashes and how that can be used for securing funding and implementing safety programs. So this is the history of transportation safety. I think we briefly mentioned that, but, but the idea of this, this is that, you know, as we, as the time has passed, we have taken a more data-driven approach. We are doing more economic analysis to justify engineering improvements, right? So, so earlier we were basically pushing for more education and enforcement very, very early uh, in 1900 to 1920 when there were very few crashes. Then we looked at individual crashes and what went wrong. But as the number of crashes grew, we couldn't quite take that approach so then we looked at like patterns of crashes. Initially, the focus was on education and enforcement and behavior, but then more recently, we have taken more responsibility on the engineering side, and now we are making a more data-driven approach. And the whole highway safety manual is a result of result of taking more data-driven approach uh, towards traffic safety. So high safety analysis, you could do either hotspot analysis. We see a large number of crashes at location, Let's try to fix that. But we know that some, sometimes, especially for pedestrian crashes, that approach may not work. So what we try to do is we look at where the crashes are happening now. We identify risk factors based off of that. And then we look at system-wide where similar crashes may be expected, even though they may not have occurred just yet. And then we try to address crashes on the whole system, whether where they're both, where they're occurring now, and where they might occur. And, and you know there are multiple ways of getting funding for this type of program. If you implement safe systemic safety, you can do safe routes to school programs, local safety, uh, local road safety uh, manual that's provided in uh, that that's developed by Safe Track at UC Berkeley. You know the the people who maintain the TIMS data, and then California Office of Traffic Safety as well is a good resource uh, for 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 implementing systemic safety analysis. So highway safety improvement program, it's a federally fund, federal funding mechanism. So it's, the money is federal, but it's uh, funneled through Caltrans. So you, you still submit the application to your local DOT. So that's just basically HSIP cycle funding. Uh, Sean provided, uh, our student provided some detail on how many programs were funded and then how much money uh, in millions of dollars were distributed. And you could see that the award funding has been increasing. Uh, in during the HSP cycles, and the application funding has been somewhat variable. Uh, the funding went, uh, I believe, uh, application went down, but then they have crept up uh, over time. But the overall idea is that you want to provide a high benefit cost ratio, and those are the type of projects that get funded. And and this is sort of the pieces of puzzle that come puzzles that come together. The strategic highway safety plan. Highway, highway safety improvement program, high risk rural roads program. So these are different types of programs that provide funding for safety improvement program. 
uh, uh, HSIP is just one of those programs. Okay, and this is based on U.S. code. So as I said, the federing, funding is federal, but it comes, uh, it's funneled through through CalCon. <clears throat> so California instituted a new program called Systemic Safety Analysis Report Program, in, instituted in 2016. It used 10 million of the HSIP program funding for cities to implement systemic safety throughout their jurisdiction. Okay. And you guys are familiar with the systemic safety program, systemic safety study that I talked to you earlier about in, in regards to uh, pedestrian crashes, but that, that same conditions or same ideas could be applied more generally. So this program, the systemic safety analysis report program was implemented in 2016. And what Caltrans said was that, okay, they, they told the city, hey, we'll give you the money to do this systemic safety uh, study conducted. And you figure out, and you have that on your file. And then you use that on a continuous basis to seek funding from HSIP. Okay, So this was sort of like a initial funding in 2016 was cities to develop this uh, systemic safety analysis report. Uh, and I'll share that report that Sean shared with us for the West city of West Sacramento. So you can see what that report looks like and I'm probably gonna go over that briefly. Okay. And, and then how do you, and then use that systemic safety report for your future funding allocation request. Okay. And then you, you should have countermeasures there and then you should have some prioritization mechanism in that report. And then this was, uh, so for example, this is for Solano County. You can see that similarity from what you saw. So for Solano County, they said, okay, signal on intersection, there might be signal crashes or stop or regulatory crashes. And then there might be non-regulate, non-intersection crashes uh, for pedestrian. So they wanted to look at all pedestrian crashes, one that occurred on intersection versus non-intersection. So this is systemic safety analysis of pedestrian collision trends. So intersection and non-intersection. So for non-intersection, these are the four more contrib uh, most contributing causes. And then for intersections, these are the four for signal signals and for stop signs and other regulatory signs. You know, these were the more con most contributing causes. And then based off of that, based off of that, you could look at, uh, you know, you can look at, okay, where the problem spots are and then how do you address these problem issues? Okay, so that kind of bifurcating the crash data as you move forward. So common safety data sources in California, Switters, that's the statewide, TIMS, you're very familiar with that. And Crossroads, it's like a local Crossroads database. Crossroads is, is a type of database that's maintained, that's used by several cities and different cities use different programs, but Crossroads is one of the things that, they, that is used by many cities. It's sort of a local database and data quality is highly dependent on the local police department. If, it, if there is a good collaboration between the local police department and the public works division, and you have sort of good database, look good geo data, and you could use that. But if you don't have that, then you have to rely on the statewide data that might potentially be incomplete. But the more complete data you have in general, the more uh, uh, the most improved rate uh, analysis that you could do. So again, you guys are very familiar with this. They're trying to implement where, what are factors responsible for all crashes, okay? so. Location type for fatality, uh, you know, uh, and injury crashes, and then uh, you know, so what what factors are uh, responsible uh, for that? And then you you could you could sort of see the hot spots, but in systemic safety analysis, as you can you know, we try to go beyond the hot spots. So we look at these hot spots, and then we figure out what factors are responsible at the hot spots, and then we look for those factors throughout our network. I mean, this is a map of West Sacramento uh, study. And then you identify countermeasures by system trends. Okay. And then <clears throat> this funding eligibility criteria. So this is based on the HSIP program funding criteria that's specified by the, by the state. And then there are maybe things that you can fund from 
uh, you know, directly from the HSIP funds, then you can see some of these things are like only 90%. So then that's where the state requires the match funding. So the cities have to come up with 10% of the funding for doing this, okay? And those criteria are specified in your grant funding application. So this funding eligibility is for the HSIP program because some uh, intersection lighting, for example, could be 100% funding, 100% funded by uh, the HSIP program, but some are not. The CRF is the crash reduction factor. And then you could see which crashes does it reduce. Okay, so that's, that's basically your X is there. It, it, it reduces that, that type of crashes. And then feasibility of implementable projects. Uh, idealized countermeasure selection. Could you support it using the city and staff support? And then cost and benefit, does it have enough cost and benefit? And then does it provide design, like could you, could you feasibly implement it? And then if you could do all of these things, then you come up with a final project list and then you decide, okay, which, so this final project list is something that you come up in your, in your, I'm sorry, I wanna show. The final project list should be something that's part of your systemic safety analysis report. So then once you have that ready to go, then when the funding source comes along, then you match your project criteria or project list with could I seek this package of projects to this funding program? So you, you be sort of that initial funding that was instituted in 2016, that helps the cities and the local jurisdictions be ready. When the funding opportunity comes along, they should be ready with their final project list and then try to match their final project list with the funding source, okay? And then focus on what can be locally implemented to pursue funding, and then large scale trends that can be addressed using policy changes over larger time periods. So here is sort of like an example of funding source determination. Let's say in your systemic safety analysis report, as a city, you identify some projects that are less than $100,000 and can be accomplished in less than two years then what do you do with it? You try to find funding for that in-house and then local operation manage, uh, operation and maintenance. Could you do that? But if there are things that are sort of more than 100K, then you, uh, uh, then you seek funding from HSIP on the next cycle of the HSIP cycle 10 was the cycle when, when, and when Sean was here, uh, you will, you'll apply for the latest cycle of funding. And HSIP typically funds, uh, projects that are more than two years, two to five years, and uh, are, are even, they could be even longer time frame than that. Uh, they could take that much time to fully implement. And then uh, um, ATP, the, the, ATP the, the acronym sort of escapes me right now, but it's basically um, transportation project funding, uh, you know, the ATP is another funding mechanism. And I'll, I'll try to find that acronym for you uh, once the class is over. And that, and again, and when Sean presented to us, that was a cycle four, that was the current one. But that project or that particular program funds projects that are anywhere between two to five years uh, or even less than five years, but they don't typically fund projects that are more than five years. So then if you have a project that's more than 100K and goes from two to five years, then you can either use HSIP program or the ATP program for, seek fund, for seeking funding for it. But again, you need to identify these things, whether or not your project is a two to five year time frame or five year time frame or less than two year time frame, and how much is it going to cost? Less than hundred thousand or more than hundred thousand dollars. You need to know all of this, and that knowledge comes from that systemic safety program report. That. Uh, cities were provided funding to do. Okay, so 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 that's the importance of having that systemic safety assessment program in place, so that when the funding comes along, the HSIP or ATP or any other program funding that may become available, you are ready to take advantage of that because you will have that cost information, you'll have the safety benefits information, you'll have what the time frame for the project is, and all it will be a matter of just sort of filling out the template for for your project. And then you try to, uh, you know, you could also, if you know which projects you want to go for, you can also packages the project 
into different ones. And, and here are some examples. Okay, you can submit multiple HSIP application. So you could call it geometric modification as approaches to intersection. And that those projects could look like installing raised medians and creating directional multiple uh, multi medians. And then you want to implement that on, on four of these locations. And then the project cost is 324,000 if you did this, and the benefit cost ratio is 48.52, right? So that's that's something that you could you could then do. So then you could you could do it for other places as well. <clears throat> and for some of them, you might not know the benefit cost ratio. You might have to not available because you might have to still estimate it. And you might not have everything in place for some of those things. So and and there might be some, uh, you know. There might be some projects that, for example, include construction of ADA curb ramps uh, and curb extension. And I, I uh, Sean put a not applicable here. You guys, does anybody recall from maybe 322 or 222 lab where we learned about benefit cost analysis? You might be able to explain why it's HSIP application number four that you see on this slide why is the benefit cost ratio not available or not applicable for this HSIP program funding number four? Can you recall the discussion on benefit cost ratio analysis from your introductory transportation class? Why that benefit cost ratio might be unavailable or not applicable here? Any thoughts on that? And this should take you back to 322 discussion or 222 discussion on benefit cost ratio. Anybody wants to, um, remembers? Okay, I'll give you a hint. In that class, we usually talk about when you don't apply, what are some of the reasons to not apply benefit cost analysis? When do we not do benefit cost analysis in engineering decision making? Does that ring a bell at all? When do we not do benefit cost analysis? No, doesn't ring a bell at all. So we typically don't do, anybody wants to raise their hand and talk? <clears throat> when do we not do benefit cost analysis? Is that, do you recall that at all? Like in that class, is there any reason when we don't do benefit cost analysis? Nobody remembers it. So we always do benefit cost analysis. Are there circumstances when we don't? Okay, it looks like you haven't quite, you, you guys don't remember what we discussed in 222 or 322, but the idea is that we typically are, should not do benefit cost analysis when you're meeting a legal requirement. So when, you, when your project involves meeting a legal requirement, that's when you don't do benefit cost analysis. You're not supposed to do, for that piece, you don't want to do benefit cost analysis because that legal requirement has to be met. So, so that's why that last HSIP program application number four, because it had the ADA curb ramp and curb extensions, to make, meet the American Disabilities Act ADA requirements, that's why we, we that benefit cost analysis was not applicable because it's a legal requirement that you have to meet. Okay, I hope that's clear now. So again, we try to package different projects, and sometimes you know we might have to package different projects to maybe lower the BCR because if you're implementing, if I mentioned that in the last class when we were talking about systemic safety is that when you are actually dealing with systemic safety analysis, you will end up using spots that are not really hot spots. They haven't seen a lot of crashes and start making improvements at those locations. And when you do that, your benefit cost estimates may not be as high. So sometimes you might wanna you know, sort of package different projects such that your benefit cost ratio sort of averages out between these projects. Sometimes you might have to play, uh, you know, just rearrange some of your projects so that your benefit cost ratio is high. For some projects where it's very, very high, 
you try to package those projects with some somewhere in a systemic safety analysis where the benefit cost ratio is not as high. So it still looks way above the threshold, but so something like, so for example, sometimes you might want to package this, some projects, if they make sense, if they make sense, sometimes packaging pack projects that have a BCI ratio, benefit cost ratio of like almost like 50, you might want to package some of these projects with like that have a benefit cost ratio of two or three, for example, right? So that it's still above, appears above a certain number. And on average, your BCR ratio becomes higher. Yes, if you take out some projects from that BCR ratio of 50, maybe it brings it down to like 30, right? Still pretty high, but now you are able to package some of those projects along with, with another project that otherwise would have a hard time getting approved. And obviously that has, that whole package has to make sense and that still has to meet your systemic safety goals and so forth. But sometimes you might have to do some repackaging of the project. So, so here is some flow chart of like, how do you improve local safety and how do you sort of HSIP call for project process? And this is from the local road safety manual that's provided by Caltrans to local road owners. You could see this, this flow chart here. Caltrans announces for call for projects. Application inputs are, so see this one, look at the left side. Many local agencies will have location and improvement selected prior to call of project. That's what they're encouraging now as part of that systemic safety analysis project. You wanna be able to do that, okay? You will have crash data, you'll have preliminary design, You'll have a uh, total project cost so that you have uh, the, the right of way cost, the construction cost, and, and the project cost, a detailed uh, estimate. So you're able to have all this information as part of the application input. You review program guidelines because they do change somewhat from year to year. Application instructions, application form, you fill it out. Uh, location identification, uh, the problem identification. Again, this pieces, again, you might have to do uh, beforehand and then the countermeasure selection, and then calculate the V by C ratio. And then there's a tool called HSIP analyzer. So you can make, a, make use of that. Okay, if the resulting V by C ratio is low, what do you do? The local agency may use guidance from the local rate safety manual and Tim's website to identify new location and or countermeasure. So then if your V to C ratio is low for what we are trying to do, then you might have to sort of either package your projects differently or maybe look for different set of countermeasures that'll give you more bang for your buck. And then the other things of ways to increase chances of funding, the California Road Safety Manual provides guidance for a comprehensive process, like, you know, comprehensive proactive safety approach. So if you follow that, that increases. And then that proactive safety approach, basically in that local road safety manual, basically follows a more proactive safety assessment process that I mentioned in the class. And then, you know, you finish the, and then you submit the application. So that sort of is the HSI. So when I'm showing you here in this presentation that was provided to us by our, our, call, our friend uh, and, and graduate of this program, Mr. Sean Carney, what he tried to show in this presentation is how does the systemic safety process or systemic safety assessment process, how that relates or how that should be done or conducted in the context of what the agency goal often is. It's to seek funding or find funding for making safety improvements. So I hope you're clear on the context of this little presentation and how that can be, how that can be, how it uses the systemic safety analysis process to seek funding. To know all of these things in advance that you're seeing on your slide, your project duration, your cost estimate, your potential benefit estimate, if you know these things in advance, you'll be able to, to submit your application in a timely manner when the funding opportunity comes along. So what I wanna show now is I wanna stop the sharing and ask you guys, are there any questions about, about how systemic safety assessment process feeds the grant funding process that the agencies have to use? For, for securing the funding for the improvement. Any questions? Okay, I see something on chat now. Okay. Okay, 
Thank you. Uh, so Brian informs me what the uh, acronym for ATP is. It's the Active Transportation Program. I had uh, some Caltrans guest speaker talk about this ATP in our class. I just could not remember it off the top of my head. Yes, that, that's the Active Transportation Program. And it has to have an access to improvements related to bicyclists and pedestrians. So you have to address the, the need for the vulnerable road users when you, when you seek funding from the ATP. So that's the Active Transportation Program. Uh, thank you very much, Brian, I appreciate it. Uh, it almost like you worked for the city or something, right? So uh, thank you, I appreciate that. So ATP stands for Active Transportation Program or uh, where you can seek funding for any projects that deal with, uh, that deal with uh, bicycle and pedestrian. Okay, so any questions so far uh, about uh, what we talked about, how systemic safety analysis project or our analysis approach can help you use that for your funding programs or, or for your for seeking funding as a jurisdiction. And, and you know this topic is important, whether you are doing safety work as, as part of a public agency or you're doing this work as part of a private consultant, because a lot of time, a lot of communities don't have resources to do this work in-house. So a lot of times they'll be relying on private consultant. So having that capability as a private consultant is important. And if you're working with a private consultant as part of a city uh, and you, you work for a city or a local jurisdiction, then knowing that process could be important. And obviously, if you know this process inside and out, you could potentially do this in-house as well. So it just depends on the city priorities, but I think knowing the systemic safety process or the systemic safety assessment process and, and then how to use that process, how to use the results of that process into grant funding could be, could be very useful. So I hope you got some background of that and I'm looking for any questions you, might, you guys might have. You can either type up the questions in chat or you can raise your hand to ask any questions. I'm not seeing any questions, that's, that's fine. What I'll do is I will make this presentation available uh, to you guys. And then also you'll obviously have the recorded video of the session as well. So you should, you should have that in place. I just wanna quickly uh, pause the recording here.